Hello, I'm Richard Gattieri, and I'm at the Italian American Museum on Mulberry Street in New York City. What you're going to see now is a poetry reading of my new book of poetry, The Other Colors in a Snowstorm, read with actors and actresses who are friends of mine who will be reading the poems, some of them in French, some of them in Italian, most of them in English. The event you're going to also be seeing is a storytelling night I did at the DR Lounge called Love the Night, which are stories about me growing up in New York City with Italian American uh, parents and family and how I became a writer and a lot of other stories. Um, some of the poems um, connect to some of the stories that you'll be seeing in Love of the Night, which is um, stories of how I became a writer, why I wrote about certain themes, and some of these themes will appear in the poetry. So some are actually poems, published poems, and Love of the Night is actually unpublished storytelling of um, maybe a, over a dozen stories that I tell and we'll be telling again soon. When she left me, I paced the floor like a madman. I hugged the walls and cried like a baby. I tore my shelves of books apart, throwing them across the room in fits of anger and rage. When she left, I lived like a dying man on the phone listening to it ring until I fell asleep. With the sun rising white in the sky outside my window. When she left, I held a loaded gun in my hand, fantasizing how she would react to news of my brains being blasted crosswise in the front door and her photograph hanging innocently on the wall above my desk. When she left me, I felt the pain the terminally ill talk about, jumping out of bed every five minutes of sleep, wondering if the agony will ever go away. When she left me, I felt as if every living relative and every close friend had just died an awful death leaving me sole heir to land struck by drought. <laughs> when she left me, I felt the terrible wrath of the gods displeased at me for some heinous crime I had committed. My life, from that moment until forever, has become an offering in the name of love. Okay, um, for the first 12 years of my life, I had the personality of a molecule. <laughs> I was as charming as an amoeba. <laughs> so what's changed? <laughs> that, that helps. Um, but there was this, something happened when I was 12 and a half, 13 years old. And um, it's when I became an artist. I still remember the moment, which was half a century ago, of what happened. Um, I thought life was this very confusing mess, made no sense. And then they sat me in school at St. Stanislaus in Basket, Queens, next to June Aurora. Now, for eight years, I watched June come to school out of school, leave school. The Greeks call it a muse, but this is not a story about a muse. The Romans call it a genius, this is nothing about genius. But something happened in eighth grade. And up to that point, I really didn't have any purpose. And then she sat next to me. Now think of eight years. Think of eight years from 40 to 48. It's a lot of time. Think of eight years from 20 to 28. So for eight years I went to school, and now she sat next to me. Ralph Russo, who went to my high school reunion, said, I knew you for eight years in St. Stan's and you never said anything. And I said, I, yeah, you're right. I never said a word to anybody. I was an amoeba. I was non-existent personality. Then I sat next to June Aurora. So June was 13, 
and she had a mass of beautiful black hair. And she had opal green eyes. She was part Puerto Rican, part Irish. And when I sat next to her, I said, this is an opportunity. And I realized, all these stories are actually gonna connect to this moment. So I went home that night and I wrote a love letter. Well, it wasn't really a love letter, but it was really clever because I didn't say anything for eight years to anybody in school. But I wrote this letter which said, I'm not as smart as Georgie Stefano. I'm not as tough as Jimmy Hoffman. And I'm not as charming as Marty Darn. Those were the three guys. <laughs> Clearly, I compared myself to <laughs> But I want to be your boyfriend. I didn't even know what that meant. <laughs> I had no idea what it would be to have a girlfriend, but I just couldn't stop staring at her. So, I wrote the letter. I kind of vaguely remember writing the letter. So the next day, when Sister Alalusis was taking attendance, <laughs> I slid my letter next to Jim. High socks. <laughs> but I always looked straight ahead because I was petrified. So I didn't speak to her. And I gave her the letter. And she opened the letter and she read the letter. And I have to say, with perfect poise, she just turned to me and said, I have a boyfriend. He's in the army. <laughs> I mean, think about it, it's Queens, right? And, um, he's in Vietnam. So that, that would just be a story in itself. But here's what changed my entire existence. She, she said to me, and I guess it's because I gave her the letter, she said, I have a letter from him, from Vietnam. And she opened the letter, and a piece of paper came out of the letter, fell out, and it was a poem. And she looked at me and said, you should read this. Now, I had never seen a poem before. Forget about what was in school, something about love a tree. I don't know what was. <laughs> <laughs> this was like a poem written by a flesh and blood guy who was probably 18 in Vietnam. And I remember looking at it, and I could still remember that moment because it was like someone stuck a hose to my arm and turned on something that flowed right through it. It was a moment of sensuality and it was a moment of awareness. And that changed me for my entire life. I went home that night and I wrote a poem. And this isn't gonna make any sense, but in my three doors down was my friend Ralphie and his father was Sam. And Sam landed on Omaha Beach. Um, and he got hit by a mortar. So he had a really cute younger wife, and we'll get to that later. But <laughs> I wrote this poem called, Today I Am 40 Years Old. I'll give you the first few lines. Today I am 40 years old, and my story has never been told. When I landed on the beach that day, home felt far away. That was my first poem. So there were a couple more lines. I brought it to school and I gave it to Jim. Of course. I was like, you think your guy can write a poem? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll write a poem too. In fact, mine's more to start. But I didn't say anything, I gave it to her. And what she did was she got up and gave it to Sister Aloysius. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Sister Aloysius read it and said, come with me. And she introduced me to every class of the eighth grade. This is Richard Battieri, the poet. <laughs> True story. My whole life was changed by this young girl, um, but it gets actually better. I went home that night a little frustrated, obviously, that she wasn't going to be my girlfriend. So I wrote her another love letter, which actually is part of my personality, opportunist, and persistent. <laughs> so. I gave her the, the letter again, and I could still see her face, and she said, I have a boyfriend, he's coming home on leave. I can't be your girlfriend. So, that night I went home, walking to school over the overpass, mass, but if you're ever going to the city from Long Island Expressway, 
There's the old Pest. Came down the old Pest with my Hopalong Cassidy. Oh, my box. <laughs> and it was a gray, gloomy day. And I stood at the park, and I had this Byronic moment. <laughs> and I cursed God and said, I will never be loved. And I took my love letter that she had given me back, and I threw it into the wind and watched under the gray sky to let it just blow on the side. And that was the end of it, so I go. Next day, I go into school, and I'm coming online. You know, we used to have to stand online. And there was Veronica Polis, hot. Dorothy Forte, hot. And <laughs> hot, hot. And they're all standing there looking at me as soon as I entered the schoolyard with Hathaway and Cassidy. <laughs> and I walked to the line, and they all looked at me and said, oh my god, you're a poet and a lover. <laughs> For some absurd, impossible way to explain, Veronica Polis walking her door that night found my love letter on the side. <laughs> yeah. True. That's why when you're a writer, people go, oh, you, know, you can't make this stuff up. Yeah. <laughs> so now I was in the annals of St. Stan's you know, social networking of Marty Nardi, George Stefano, Jimmy Hoffman, and Lava Paul Richard, the two. Hollywood Boulevard. Hollywood Boulevard. I sign with a studio, and they tell me who I am. Drop the weight, fatty. It's a game. It's a sham. I jump rope, dance all day. I'm a star on the big screen. I'm always somebody I ain't. How'd I get in this dream? I played Caruso and got raves. My mother said, it's your destiny. Got the kinks out of my hair, but it all got the best of me. Back on Mercy Street, my father drove a truck. All my friends died young. Somehow, I got the luck. My wife pops pills to sleep. My manager hasn't a clue. I'm driving down Hollywood Boulevard, being told what to do. So I'm going to tell a bullying story. So here I am in Monsignor McClancy High School, which is all boys. Half of them are homicidal maniacs. The other half are marginal human beings. And there's like 10 of us that are wondering why does life feel like we live on the other side of the Cold War wall in Germany, Berlin. Because that's what it felt like. If you were growing up in, a, in, the, in the 60s in a high school, a Catholic high school, fear is what motivated you. Not fear from the brothers, fear from the other school. So, I had a friend, I called him, um, Charles Bronson. <laughs> because he looked like Charles Bronson, he acted like Charles Bronson, and he was the only guy who ever talked to me. And I was freshman in the air, and we would hang out by ourselves, looking at all the homicidal maniacs. And then like after lunch, you got a break, where you walk the perimeter, like in Alcatraz with Lenny <laughs> And there were, you know, Bob Wire. <laughs> And you would just hope nobody stabbed you. But you had a suit and tie on. You had those, un those ties that popped out, popped on. So, and the brothers were fine. If they didn't like you, they hit you. But they were fine. There were only like 10 of them. So my problem was there was a bully. And you hear all these bullying stories now. And I have a good way to deal with the bully. I think this was pretty neat. I had a guy named Eddie Lynch. Now, every Thursday, you would have chicken and a terrific lemon cake. Lemon cake. That was the dessert. Everybody loved the lemon cake. It was the only reason to go to school on Thursday. <laughs> so I would sit with Charlie Manson. Uh, Charlie Manson. <laughs> Charlie Bronson. <laughs> Maybe you can hear Charlie Bronson. Me and Charlie Bronson, and we'd sit there. And this guy, Eddie Lynch, he was like 6'4". I guess he was Irish. I was Italian. He didn't like me for some reason. And he would come up to my table, and he would go, the jury. Thursday, lemon cake. <laughs> and take my cake. Just like, take my cake. So I, 
I, I went to Charles Bronson. Did you see that? He goes, you gotta do something, man. That guy's like 6'4". Now, you know, if you go to an old boys' school, there's always a place where if you have a problem with a guy, you say, I'm in the pancake house. <laughs> yeah, four. If I met him at four, he would have killed me. I've seen guys like get the shit kicked out of him. So I couldn't do that. So every Thursday he'd come, he'd come to my table and move to Thursday. <laughs> so Charlie Bronson said, you know, if this continues, you're not going to have much of a reputation. <laughs> this is all true story. So I came up with a pretty brilliant plan, I thought. The next day, I went to the toughest guy in class, Jimmy Kerwin. And I said, Jimmy, I got a problem. I have a deal for you. I'll do your homework. <laughs> but I gotta, this guy Eddie Lynch keeps taking my key. <laughs> Every Thursday. So there I am in the perimeter, you know, where Clint Eastwood would hang out. And, and there's Jimmy Carlin, there's, um, there's Mikey Miles and Nicky DeVito, like the three toughest guys in school. So Jimmy says, really, he's taking your key. <laughs> He goes, that's not good. I know. I gotta do something. I'll do your homework. Now you gotta remember, I didn't talk to anybody but you know Charlie Bronson. So this was a big step for him. So he said, here's what you do. Next time he reaches for your cake, take your form. So I said, all right, okay. You sure. So I can't watch The Godfather One. And Al Pacino, you know, Michael Corleone goes into the bathroom to get the gun. That's actually my friend Sonny Brussels, 38. And he gets the, the 38 and comes out and, you know, pops the two guys. Because for a week I'm planning, okay, I can four. <laughs> Can't stand him like a girl. So I got to like a guy. So I was planning that at night, you know, in my room with a four. So Thursday came. And it was a hard, I don't think I slept the night before. <laughs> and I'm um, sitting next to Charlie Bronson. And he goes, it's Thursday. I go, I know it's Thursday. <laughs> it's freaking lemon cake. I even thought maybe sometimes not take the cake, but that, he told me that would look bad too. <laughs> so, Eddie Lynch gets up, and they could see him coming right at me. And he comes up to the table and goes, Terry, Thursday. <laughs> I took the floor. Right on his hand, I could see the blood. I saw him scratch his blood. And he screamed and he grabbed. I could still see him grabbing his hand. And I saw Brother Robert turn. And I saw Eddie see Brother Robert and go this way. And Charlie Brunson turns to me and goes, You're dead. <laughs> what the hell did you do? So now the bell goes off, and I just make a beehive towards the perimeter. My knees was up on the thing, and the bob wire, and there's Jimmy Kerr and Mikey Miles and Nicky DeFino in their corner of a homicide of maniacs right there, smoking. <laughs> they weren't supposed to be here, the cigarettes on the side. So I come up and go, Jimmy, Jimmy, I did it. And he goes, What'd you do? I said, You know, Eddie Lynch takes my cake. Well, yeah, I did what you said. I took a fork and I stabbed him in the hand. He goes, what? <laughs> I said, you told me to stab him in the hand. He says, wow, you did that? I go, yeah. <laughs> and he's coming. I could see him glitch, man, moving his way like this. Who's going to kill me there? Forget about, you know, the pancake. Who's going to kill me there? So he's pushing everybody away, just like in Alcatraz, actually. And he's making his way towards me. And Jimmy says, get behind us. So I got behind him. Jimmy Carr and Mikey Brothers, and Nikki DeVito, and Eddie Lynch comes up, and Jimmy, Jimmy Cohen looks right at him and goes, the teary is with us. <laughs> <laughs> he said, turn around, and don't have a fuck with me. The rest of my life, the rest of my life, it starts right here. Or so I imagine it does, somewhere between ice storms and heat waves, as lifelong friends, mostly dead or buried, do sing-alongs at parties held in my head. Naps bring me the most vivid images of women mostly, my mother, long-ago girlfriends, 
Sometimes my brothers make an appearance in the old house. We are young, jumping around, talking a mile a minute, doing things we never did, as real as just now and in minute detail, exploding across the screen. Human beings like to create start and finish lines just so they can stick a price tag on time spent. But they are arbitrary and never last long. What does have meaning is the rest of it, facing us like a bowl of pasta. It all tasted great, the sauce, the meatballs, and the Parmesan cheese. But you left some, and you don't know why. Thank you. My name is Thank you. This is a serious story. My grandfather and my grand... <laughs> my grandfather and my grandma were married. Uh, my mother's father and father. And um, my grandfather was a gambler and he was a truck driver. And he worked at the docks. And he said, you know, I see the Statue of Liberty every day. Uh, and he was born here, but right on Brooklyn he saw the Statue of Liberty. And my grandma was a very attractive lady, blue eyes, premature gray hair. And then she got a job at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and was quickly made the head shop steward of the electricians. And she was a woman, first woman. So my grandfather threw her out of the house. Wow, there's a lot of ladies here, so let's just think about it. You got a job in your husband for a So my grandfather threw her out because she had a job. And um, so he was alone a long time. And when my mother would go to the house that was on uh, Lama Street, uh, Lama, um, yeah, Lama and Richardson, right near the Karen Park, we'd go there and, and my mother would clean the house for him. And he would go to me, so did you see your grandmother in her pimp? Because she had a boyfriend. <laughs> and he would call her a pimp. And his name was the same name, Mike. So, um, when my grandmother died, she was about 60, there was a big wake, and the funeral parlor was packed, and I was 17. No, I was 15, I was about 15, 16. And I was standing in the back, and I heard this man say, all my life she made me wait for her, and now that she's dead, I have to stand in line to see her. And I turned, it was my grandfather. So my grandmother died, my grandfather, about five years later, had a stroke, and I was with him when he was dying. And he said, Anna's been calling me all night. That was my grandmother's name. So he asked my mother if he could be buried with her. And they did. But the one thing I left out in the story is that they could never be in the same room together. I don't know if you know Italians, but uh, I really love, and a lot of younger people tell me, oh, that's like really tough. Oh, it's like horrible. I, you know, I've never been to a therapist. You know, my grandparents didn't go to therapy. But my grandfather and grandmother could never be in the same room together. So my, my mother had to deal with, like, if it's my confirmation, my grandfather would come for two hours, and then he had to leave, and then my grandmother would come. That went on for 20 something years. Yeah, so my mother had to put up with a lot of stuff, and she was really tough. So after my grandmother died, and then my grandfather died, uh, my grandmother's boyfriend came to the house. And I remember my mother was doing something washing dishes, and he had said he misses his, my grandmother, and, but he had gone to Miami, he met a new woman, and he thinks he's going to be okay. And then my grandmother, I'm sorry, my mother turned to him and said, get out of my house. And don't you ever come to my house again. I've put up with this for 20 years. And I was like, God damn, she tough. So he quickly called her brother, my brother, and he ran to her. She wouldn't talk to him. My father, my father was always afraid to talk to him. I was going to talk to him. He would always go, you talk to him. Because I was the oldest. And she threw Mike out of the house. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, I don't know, man, that's a code. You know? Like, it wasn't his fault. But he should know better to pass that line and to go over that line. So, um, when my mother was dying, she threw my brothers out of the house. Just get out of the house. I was like, yeah, I, I just hope I could be that tough as my mother's. I obviously was the oldest I went in the house. So if I can't throw me out, you're going to have to deal with this. But, um, um, which leads me to... A Dream of Angels. 
Though I walk into the room as a wave, I do not break against the ceiling as a shore, nor empty myself into every corner of the room, but open slowly to ways in which I sleep. Though once in tune with the voices in the walls, now I hear a knock of whispers from the floor above that weigh on my shoulders like the drizzle of the rain. Up from the wind, some envisioned wings. Though I open like a word silent on a page, I drive with the meaning of every sentence that I hear and hold close the wings of angels crowded at my head and break the neck of every in my sleep. This is the Tower of Babel. It all began in a small room in a house full of people. It all began as he grew awkward, his body fused with energy, elbows and joints tense with vitality, and eyes that blew off the top of his head. Learning a language that began at the side of the city, he was alone, timid, groping, and in the distance all he saw was a future with him groping, timid and alone. It all began with a thought that he did not belong. She survived the grip of an indifferent fist around her and screams that could suffocate in the middle of the night. The yells her parents cried blasted through the railroad apartment as she closed out the world around her. Her own dark eyes burned darkness through her, darkness only she could mediate. She survived the grip of, of the fist. She survived the mirrors of her own image locked in the tide of her island in the darkness aware of how frightfully inadequate her own language was. It all began with the thought that she was alone and how desperately she wanted to belong. When he saw her face, he wanted to build a bridge to heaven and carry everything warm about her to their silence and the stars. Her eyes saw him as no one else ever had. When she heard him speak, she felt as if it were the first time anyone in the world had talked to her at all. She saw his eyes open up the darkness into a thousand possibilities she had never known before. When they touched, they held each other tightly as his thoughts took them a thousand miles away. He taught her language as definite as her darkness. She latched onto his words as they spirited through the night. His shoulders became her guardian, her love his anchor. They settled into oneness, crushing out the ruins that came before them. Her personality lifted him to heights only he dreamed, as he thought, and created her in her landscapes she had never seen. With her strength beside him, he was ready to build the tower created by the thoughts that he did not belong. She fueled that energy with her tremendous longing to be part of something other than herself. They fused themselves together with an intimacy, a knowledge of each other, brutal and real. He began to mimic her words and phrases as she made the intense thoughts he had her own. He memorized the firmness of her body. He could taste her even in the private moments he had without her. She struggled with his agonies, trying to understand them, aware, perhaps, that they could never be her own. Together they set their sights on the mountain of air before them, laying stone upon stone in their journey to the top. A man and a woman, under clouds of youth and illusion, they never wanted, they wanted to reach some fantasy neither had ever seen. She wanted his happiness to control her insecurities, and he wanted her to call him a god. She allowed him the freedom of his ambitions. She wanted him to build his pride on the foundation of her heart. He wanted her to reach up to him forever, praising his vision that he did not belong. Together they built a tower to their misconceptions in a language they so secretly kept from where she survived and he began. In his reach upward, his shoulders shook her shadows. She found her grip around him, constraining his every move. He tried to pull her up close and sometimes throw her out of his glory as he reached for more and more. He found himself in places he never dreamed of, unable to share the view with anyone at all. He believed that he had created a reason for the tower that went beyond any reason he had ever known. He learned more about the heavens and the planet, wondering why she had not gained this knowledge too. He questioned why she was with him and what she had to offer his god upon the ledge. She kept the pain to herself from the beginning, not wanting to tell him that she had lived it all through him. Her silence brought her back to the beginning as if she had traveled nowhere at all. She didn't want to see him, as he was forming into something only the thin air could create. 
He was now a master builder, creating towers of illusion in a world of fantasy she had helped him to make. She started to choke on the absurdity of his glory, and the needs he shouted slowly made her suffocate. They screamed at one another as they brought the tower upward, both afraid of the heights they had traveled, both afraid that they might fall. When they fell, it was their speech that went first. They had stopped talking to one another. She no longer believed it mattered that he didn't belong, and once again she felt the indifferent fist around her. He tried hard to bring her back to the beginning and make her see what she had once seen before, but as she spoke they could no longer understand one another. They no longer could control the secret of their speech. When the tower fell, he felt his world topple over, and a thousand agonies stuck him all over again. He reached for her and tried again to touch her, crying out how desperately he wanted to belong. He tried to hide the thought forever, the thought that shaped the tower he had created. But when he tried, it was her face that was all he could remember, and her name that lay silent among the stones at his feet. She buried his memory in the fury and the rubble, doing what she always could do best, surviving the indifferent fist around her in the language which was her silence, hollowed out from fears of being seen. It all began with a thought that shaped the future, a thought that shaped the personality of the thinker and a map made of everything the thinker planned. In the pursuit of that thought, he found a lover who helped him imagine a tower in the sky. A tower created out of imagination and ambition, with a deep-rooted longing to belong. The city still stands. So does the small room and the indifferent fist around her and the thought. But in the pity of a language once kept secret, they, they no, no longer, longer speak. speak. That was like a real fun gift to myself. <laughs> Anybody who knows me, I'm always giving myself gifts. Um, I want to thank all the poets and actors and, and friends that read. That was really great. And I want to thank Joseph for allowing us to do this here. Pleasure. And um, the colors in another song. The color, the other colors in a snowstorm. <laughs> um, it, our poems uh, are for the last 30 years. The other colors in a snowstorm, um, I wrote while well, snowed in um, about 30 years ago. So it's interesting that when I had to title the book, I really didn't know what to call it. So I'm, I'm kind of glad that I did call it this, and I'm kind of glad that it's spring. So. Orange is the lit window in the dark or a rooftop on the other side of the sky, the colorless sound of a dog's bark or an oriole on a branch before it flies. There's a fireplace glowing on a hill where imagined strangers sit around and talk. I was one of them once a long time ago, standing at an open door, watching it snow. Blue is the snow on the fields at night and the cars on the highway passing by and the color of your eye when you flash on a light and the moon rising in the sky. I never see much red in the winter months except for the sun rising over my bed. Can you feel the wind as you dream? Does it matter what all the colors mean? Whiteness is the darkness that never goes away, stretching to the horizon in the middle of the night. White is the glare of a thousand years of day, burning with the illusion of a warm, lingering light. I remember you, laughing as we lay in the snow, helpless as the world tilted for an afternoon. What are the other colors in a snowstorm? What moments do we choose to shed or to mourn? The rainbow lives in a driving wind, though everyone else is tucked away safe inside. You were once right here where it all began, waiting for your clothes as they dried. I wonder who else sees only the snow, blasting through the heavy, hungry air. What separated you from me and everything else? Where do all the colors go after all the colors melt? You know what? I'm going to read the rest of my life. 
It starts right here, so I imagine. Somewhere between ice storms and heat waves. As lifelong friends, mostly dead and buried, do sing-alongs at parties held in my head. Naps bring me the most vivid images of mostly women. My mother, long ago girlfriends. Sometimes my brothers make an appearance in the old house. We're young, jumping around, taking a mile a minute. Doing things we never did. As real as just now and in minute detail. Exploding across the screen. Human beings like to create start and finish lines so they can just stick a price tag on time spent. But they're arbitrary and they never last long. What does have meaning is the rest of it. Facing us like a bowl of pasta. It all tasted great. The sauce, the meatballs, and the Parmesan cheese. But you left some, and you don't know why. Thank you. Boy, girl, boy, girl, or it's all short. It's all short. As long as we all short. Where's the camera? Oh, uh, so we all turn this way. Everybody turn this way. Yeah. Wait a second. Uh,